Spare. Back to Blighty. Now, before we get into more information that Harry provides us with, a little bit of history. you notice that I referred to the title of this section as Back to Blighty. Well, Blighty is a British-English slang term for Great Britain, or so often can just mean England. Though it was used throughout the 1800s in the Indian subcontinent to mean an English or British visitor, it was first used during the Boer War in the specific meaning of homeland for the English or British. And it wasn't until World War I that use of the term became widespread. The word derives from the Urdu word Valeti, meaning foreign, which then more specifically came to mean European and British English during the time of the British Raj. The term is commonly used as a term of endearment by the expatriate British community or those on holiday to refer to home. In Hobson Jobson, an 1886 historical dictionary of Anglo-Indian words, Henry Yule and Arthur Coke Burnell explained that the word came to be used in British India for several things the British had brought into the country, such as the tomato and soda water. During the First World War, Dear O Blighty was a common sentimental reference suggesting a longing for home by soldiers in the trenches. The term was particularly used by World War I poets such as Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon, mentioned in parts passing. During that war, a blighty wound, a wound serious enough to require recuperation away from the trenches but not serious enough to kill or maim the victim, was hoped for by many and was sometimes self-inflicted. So that's the etymology of blighty, so now you know. Harry tells us that he landed on March the 1st, 2008, and there was a press conference. And he went before the relevant reporter, answered the questions, and walked out of the room straight there to find William and his father. He recalls William hugging him, and that his father gave him a kiss on each cheek, and might also have squeezed his shoulder, which was an unprecedented demonstration of physical affection. They both stared at him and commented that he looked older. And they got into the Audi and zoomed off towards Highgrove. Everything was very quiet. How are you, Harold? Oh, I don't know. How are you? Not bad. How's Kate? Good. I miss anything? No. Same old. He then stuck his head out of the window after, of course, winding it down. He's not that stupid. And he recalls the various sights and smells of where he's come from. He then explains that he was given a month off. And what did he do? He decided he was going to hang out with his mates. So they heard that he was back and they rang him up and they asked him out for a drink. And they went to a place called the Cat and Custard Pot. And he was sat in a dark corner nursing a G&T. And they were all laughing and joking and planning various things. And he noticed how loud they all sound and didn't realise this and thought, had they always been this loud? And he felt a bit distant, felt a bit out of sorts, a bit out of place. After a day or two, he rang Chelsea, asked to see her. She was in Cape Town and invited him to go. So he thought, yeah, that's what I need to do. I need a bit of time with her. So they cleared off to Botswana and they met up with the gang and they started at TJ and Mike's house, big hussies, big hugs and kisses at the door now it's interesting that he's only just come back to see his brother and his father and understandably he wants to see his other half and of course they decide to go to somewhere which makes him feel comfortable Botswana and note with interest of course that Chelsea has no hesitation in going there she's perfectly content for that to be the case contrast that with of course Harry's wife who went on the trip at the beginning but she did so because that was the golden period and her narcissism basically said need to do this and make a good fist of it so she didn't think to herself oh god i don't want to do it but i'll do it anyway her narcissism caused her to embrace it but notice it's not something that she's gone back and done with any longevity notwithstanding the fact that it would make harry very happy to do so now some people might say well if she doesn't want to do it why should she Indeed, but the point is, he doesn't. she doesn't take into account what really makes him happy. She only does it where it, her narcissism decides 
that it should make him happy for the purpose of the golden period and of course in sustained devaluation because she has no emotional empathy and her narcissism then decides don't need to make him happy we can keep him under control he's treacherous he's failed us we'll keep him under control in malign ways anyway he goes off to Botswana with Chelsea and sees TJ and Mike and he, he explains I was in the place I loved most under the sky I loved most so happy that at one point I wondered if I might not have tears in my eyes. It's clear that Botswana is such a special place for him. And again, why did he not go there? A day or two later, they went up river on a houseboat and they cooked simple meals, slept on the upper deck of the boat, looked at the stars. And he said the press got wind of the trip and they were papping them. So after a week or so, they decided to say farewell. And... At the farewell dinner, he stayed up with TJ, who spoke, and he spoke to her a bit about the war. And it was really the first time that he'd properly spoken about it. He explained that although his father and William had asked about it, they hadn't asked the way that TJ had asked, nor had Chelsea. And he didn't know whether people were tiptoeing around it on purpose. He explained that Chelsea likes him, that she loves him, he guessed, but she didn't like the baggage that came with him. And because that was never going to go away, he thought there was no hope for a relationship. TJ then apparently said, well, could you see yourself being married to Chelsea? And he talked about, he talks about her carefree and authentic spirit. And he lists lots of things about her that he liked about her. Um, but he cherished all of those things, which included a carefree and authentic spirit, her wearing short skirts and high boots, that she drank as much tequila as he did, danced with abandon. And the strange thing is, is he said he couldn't help worrying how his grandmother might feel about them or the British public. Well, Harry, compare it to what you did end up with. Those are minor matters which I'm sure your late grandmother would have confirmed, and certainly the majority of people around the world would also. He explains that he really wanted to be a husband and a father, but he wasn't sure. Because it takes a certain type of person to stand, scrut stand scrutiny, rather, and he didn't think that Chelsea could handle it. What? And your current wife can. She can't handle it, because she's a narcissist, and any kind of scrutiny is a criticism of her it's perceived as a threat to control and you see the way that she responds she couldn't handle it to the extent that she dragged you to canada and then california she couldn't handle it harry to the extent that she's caused you to have nothing to do with your family she couldn't handle it to the extent that she's caused you to drink the kool-aid and end up seeing the world completely differently she's been unable to handle it in the way that she's told lies that she's made out that your family's racist that she has bullied people so all the other things you know the reams and reams of examples and instances of her poor behavior have all been as a consequence of her inability to handle the threats to control caused by criticism and scrutiny i'm sure chelsea would have managed it far better than harry's wife has he then explains that they returned to britain and they headed off to Chelsea's off-campus flat in Leeds. And he enjoyed uh, being... Uh, and the press explained that apparently he, he enjoyed being a student or pretending to be one. And that he was regularly there. Harry explains that he barely knew her flatmates and he only went to her flat twice. And he never once regretted his decision to skip university. He says the press were getting worse in in, with regard to what they were reporting. And Chelsea explained that when she was back in Cape Town, she was being tailed and it was driving her crazy. And there was a tracking device found on the car. And she said she just wasn't up for a lifetime of being stalked. He said basically that he'd miss her, but he understood her desire for freedom. And he said if he had a choice, he wouldn't want that either. So it would appear that that was the end of the relationship. And again, it's interesting because it's all done rather matter of fact, which from a chap who is rather emotional and sensitive, 
It's rather strange, and I think that's just been deliberately not included because Harry's wife wouldn't like it if he said, I was absolutely distraught at the end of the relationship with Chelsea. I really wanted to marry her. She was amazing. She had the most luscious lips that I've ever experienced. She made me jizz like there was no tomorrow. I really loved being around her. She made me laugh and I was really upset and I cried for days when I knew the relationship was over. All of that may well have been true and I'm sure he was pretty upset about the fact the relationship wasn't going to go anywhere. The way that he describes it is basically she says, I'm not really up for this, a lifetime of being stalked. And he basically goes, what could I say? I'd miss her so much. But I completely understood her desire for freedom. That isn't how a relationship ends. He'd have probably talked about maybe we can do something, maybe we can see our way through it. He'd have talked about the way he was upset. He'd have been upset with such a conversation. But of course, he's not allowed to put all of that in because Harry's wife has to be seen as the special one and nobody else. Well, that chapter ends, but we're on to another girlfriend next. Find out in the next video who that might be.